<laughs> Welcome to the Throwdown, where each week we announce a workout and we're going to invite all of you to compete with the Training Think Tank community. In this episode, we're going to uh-huh. give you pacing <laughs> what kind of voice? strategy. No, no, no. Pause, that. pause. What is that? What's wrong with your voice? Oh. Broken voice. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do this weekend? Uh, nothing, literally. I gardened. <laughs> All right, we'll finish your little sentence. All right, we got pacing, we got strategy, we got tips, and then afterward, Max gives us some uh, breakdown of the workout and how to actually like get better at the workout long term. Oh, this is gonna Here be we go. amazing. All right, Brandon, we got a lot of stuff going on this past week. We had athletes competing in Iceland, the fittest experience, the age group qualifier. I just wanted to give a shout out to Will Morad for taking one of the podium spots in Iceland. Congrats, Will. Yeah, tough competition. He did a great job out there. And then I want to give a personal shout out to Annalise Moore, one of my athletes for making it through the age group qualifier in that 16 to 17 girls division. Really impressed with that. She'll be competing out at Madison with Travis, Noah, and KT Trombetta. Pretty excited for the games this year. I think it's going to be fun. I I do too. So before we get to this week's workout, we're about to announce it. We have a little Insta spotlight. We're going to start with Hey Dom. He's doing it in his garage. Pretty cool. He has a nice setup at home. I need one of those. Yeah, I've got one. I love it. Uh, Then we got one of Adam's clients, Bryn. She's in there crushing it as well. Danielle Kearns, one of Becky's clients, doing it, I think, with her boyfriend. We got a whole group out in Bulgaria. I'm going to butcher the name, Velcho Sklov. These guys are, (laughs) are killing it out there. It's awesome to see them doing it as a group. My man, Youngy XV1, doing the workout. Looks like by himself. David Flowers solo in there. It's always tough to do the workouts on your own. And then one of my athletes, Jim Jom, you know he's crushing it. He loves these Saturday throwdowns, so he's gonna keep doing them. Our final one was Mick Mannion CrossFit. He says a little late to the party. You know, it's early enough to still get into the, the Insta Spotlight, so good work this week, guys. If you wanna be in the Insta Spotlight this week, hashtag TTTTD2. Two. Two. All right, this week's workout was brought to you by Max. So Max, take us to the workout. That voice thing. (laughs) (laughs) This week's workout is three rounds for time, 15 deadlifts, 15 chest to bar pull-ups. Immediately into three rounds for time, six clean and jerks, six muscle ups. The weight for this workout is 225 for the men, 165 for the female. So you do your three rounds of that first workout, Immediately after that, three rounds for time of the second workout. Last week's workout was fast. This week's workout is going to chew some people up, especially with the clean and jerks. As you guys know, we have an opportunity to have our athletes test it the week before, so we've got some data. Let's see what they have to say. Don't sprint out the gate too fast. Pick your stronger movement, push that. Take a little bit longer breaks for whatever you think you need. For me, I thought it was gonna be more than muscle ups, but I actually felt like it was pretty good all the way throughout. I think it was a little bit, slightly too much rest going into the clean and jerks, but for the deadlift chest bar, it's pretty fast, but I think people underestimate what the first part does. So if you need to break up the first part, break up the first part to set you up better for the second part. Break up the deadlifts early, break up the pull-ups early because it's gonna smoke your grip going into the cleans. And if you're not a strong cleaner, you gotta give yourself some time somewhere, so maybe you do have to push on the, the deadlifts and the pull-ups a little bit more. I would go a little slower on the first part than you think, because by the time you get to the cleans, your grip's pretty fried, and it's hard to pick it up. Go slower than you think you have to on the first part. I don't think the workout really starts till that, those clean and jerks. So slow down on the first part, break up the deadlifts and the chest bars, unless you're like Travis or something like that, then he doesn't have to, but. Pace it, I mean, don't come out too hot on the deadlifts. The workout's made her. Made or lost on the uh, clean and jerks, so have fun. I say pace it out until you get into clean and jerks and muscle ups. Definitely pace out those clean and jerks, but speed up on the muscle ups. Go slower in the beginning than you think. All the time's gonna be used up on the clean and jerks. All right, so we got standards here. So first off, the deadlift's pretty straightforward. You got straight arms all the way through the workout, shoulders behind the bar. Don't bounce the bar. Yeah, that's basically, I know there's so many interpretations of (laughs) bouncing too. Then chest bar, make sure your chest touches the bar at the top, not t-shirt flopping and touching the bar. And then full extension of the arms at the bottom. Clean and jerk, bar starts on the floor, gets the front rack and locks out overhead so it's not just a ground overhead. You gotta make sure you touch the front rack. Uh, show control in, in, in the overhead position. And then muscle ups, fully locked out at the bottom, fully locked out at the top. Make sure that you're not just passing through that lockout. Same standard you'd use for an open workout. 
All right, so for setup and, and scaling options, we're gonna just post all that stuff from now on in the uh, description of the workout. So just look below if you need scaling options for sure. Awesome, so I'm gonna do most of the tips and strategy today because Kyle's voice is wonky. I'd like to rest my voice. <laughs> so last <Thank> week, <laughs> yeah, right? Last week we talked about <clears throat> self-awareness and I wanna kinda stay on that theme for the next couple of weeks so that we can kinda start thinking about how to compete in these testing style workouts. And today I'm gonna introduce you guys to a concept called separation value. And we break this down kinda into two parts. First, it's separation value in a broad sense of the workout. What movement separates time gained or time lost in the workout the most, and then a personal separation value. So what are my strengths and, and weaknesses in this workout, which is kind of what we talked about last week. So think of separation value as what's going to give me the most time or lose me the most time in this workout, because that's really what it comes down to in so CrossFit. In a workout like this, you just basically look at like which movement takes up the most time, Correct. and that's gonna be the, the general separation value. Correct. Right? In most cases, that's the case. And then obviously, it, when we talk about personal separation value, we're saying, what's my bottleneck or what can get me the most time if I'm really good at something? Would that be relative? So like you and me doing this workout, you're probably better at the clean and jerks, but I'm probably better at the muscle ups. So it's going to be very dependent on the athlete. So okay. let's just say that someone has, and I'll talk about this in a minute, a muscle up limitation. That's their personal separation value, knowing, in other words, that they're going to lose time against the field. So then they have to pace the workout based on how they can get that done the fastest to not lose time. They Makes wanna sense. basically make the separation value where there's always a net positive and never a net, get, a net loss in this workout or in any other workout that they're doing. Understood. So, and in, in when we're talking about a general separation value, what's gonna lose us or gain us the most time, the clean and jerks are that movement. And we'll break down the full workout in a few minutes, but I wanna kinda let people start thinking about this stuff a little bit more than just, I need to go hard in workouts. The clean and jerks take up the most time because one, there's residual fatigue going into those from the deadlifts, but then two, that loading is just gets heavy after a while. So to give you an example, Travis did this workout and you guys can watch the demo video that's posted on YouTube today. He took 10 seconds per rep between the clean and jerks. The average person on site was taking anywhere from 20 seconds to 33 seconds per rep. So if you think about six reps in one round, now you're talking about a one minute advantage for someone that can cycle the barbell quicker like Travis. Now Travis even said afterwards, hey, I could probably cycle this a little bit faster. And so for him, that's a personal separation value and then also a general one. He could think of it, well, what happens if I just cycle this barbell two seconds faster per rep? So instead of going 10 seconds, if he could get, stay on a clock and do it, eight seconds between reps. Now over the course of six reps, he's gaining two seconds per rep, which is 12 seconds per round, which is 36 seconds in the workout. Which relative to the average CrossFitter doesn't seem like it's that much, but relative to the elites, that's a big difference at the top of a leaderboard. That's a big difference, but not only that, it is a big difference for those that are vying for a top 1,000 spot or vying True. for a qualifier spot, even True. in an intermediate division, because now when you look at the open or if you look at these online qualifiers, just a few reps separate 20 or 30 spots. And if a rep's only a few seconds, if you just cut down on those things a little bit in a workout, faster transitions, get on the barbell one second faster each rep, those are the kind of things that kind of make the difference in, in these workouts. A couple of things that you can do on the clean and jerks to speed this up. Obviously, if it's just a limitation where 225 or 165 for the females is 90% of your one rep max, there's probably not much you can do. Right. But let's say that it is around that 50 to 65 to 75%, you know, depending on how strong the athlete is, then there's some things I think that can help. One is stay on the barbell. So uh, this is obviously the most simple thing, but I noticed people on site that once they got fatigued, especially even in the first round, because obviously their respiration rate was high from the fast turnover, the deadlifts and the chest bars before, they did a rep and then they'd start walking around. I try not to hear the, the camera. Here are the things that you'll always see, people adjusting their belt. So they'll do yes. a rep, they'll step back, take the belt off, retighten the belt, or they'll go and they'll find the chalk bucket that's the furthest away from the barbell Correct. to get some, to buy some rest. Yeah, so the idea here would be come up with a plan and stick to it. So if you, if you need rest, which everyone's going to at some point in this workout, do a one step back, one step forward, bend over and grab the bar. That's one way that you can do it and just kind of try to stick with some singles. A way that you can have a psychological advantage and a time advantage for sure in this workout is to do cluster sets with the reps. So what that may look like for somebody, there's six reps each round in the clean and jerks. They do one dot one, which is basically one rep. As soon as they drop it, they pick it back up again. So it's a quick cluster of two, and then they take a 15 second break, and then one dot one, and then a 15 second break, and then finish with a one dot one, and then obviously quickly transition to your muscle ups. So that's gonna reduce the average rest time between Correct. the 
the movement or between the reps. Exactly. This is the same thing we talked about last week. We want to kind of plan out to where we're thinking about how long I want to rest for a movement. So let's say it's clean and jerks. I don't want my clean and jerks to take longer than a minute 30 around. Okay, then you can divide out the rest time and what you wanna do is say, how can I limit my rest time? And doing the 1.1 allows you to rest a little bit less than if you're doing singles where you're doing one every 20 seconds or something like right. that, right? So it's just a quick way to, one, psychologically get through the workout faster because it's like, the only thing you're thinking about is I just have two reps. 1.1 and then I can take my break. 1.1 then I can take my break. Since, since the uh, rep scheme here is a little bit shorter, it's six reps per round versus like if you were doing all 18 as a chunk, would you change that if the workout was a chipper? Yes, that would, be, that would definitely change if it was you know, 18 reps or 30 reps in a chipper style format. And we could talk about that once we, we have a chipper coming up there. Brandon, how much coffee did you drink this morning? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of coffee. I actually have some right over here. Why, am I talking fast? Yeah, you're just crushing. Yeah, so with, uh, with a chipper style workout, when we talked about this, you've used some um, devices that, that measure muscle oxygen, and we can get into the science later on, but basically we would format that differently based on someone's physiology especially, yep, or their, their training. Absolutely. Yeah, so the other thing about the clean and jerks I think that matters is making sure that you understand the first round is actually going to be the hardest as far as your respiration, your heart rate, your grip, all those things because of the fast turnover of the first three round workout. Yep. And then after that, because everything slows down, it'll get easier. Think of it this way. When you did 19-2 or 16-2, that usually for most people was that third barbell that was the worst. And then it started, if you were good enough to get into the later bars, it started slowing down a little bit. And while, yes, it's heavy, you don't have the same like metabolic pain that you had on that third barbell. It's just because everything's turning over really fast and then it slows down. So well, a lot of people have to time their heavy clean and jerk, like a 225 or a 165 clean and jerk, they have to time it with their breathing. And if your respiration rate's really high coming off the first three rounds of this workout, well, you're gonna have to take a break to be able to time your breath. Exactly. To like hold your breath and, and brace from the bottom. So the point of that is make sure that you understand that the first round, though it hurts really bad, it'll get easier for you. I know that may sound silly, but it's easier on your respiration. Your, your heart won't feel like it's going to explode. Your grip will probably calm down a little bit because you're not going as fast. After that, then you can kind of find a nice rhythm to get into for the second two rounds of clean and jerks. I saw a lot of people almost give up in the workout because the first few reps at 225 or 165 felt really hard. And then they're like, oh no, I've got two more rounds of this. But in reality, it will slow down for you. So that's on like the general separation value side. When we talk about personal separation, it could be any of these movements based on the individual like we talked about, but I just wanted to kind of bring up one and that's muscle ups because that's like an easy bottleneck for some people. Right. Either you have them or you don't, either you're good at them or you're not, kind of there's really not much in between. The nice thing is with six reps, it's not a chipper style where you have to do 20 and it's like a huge bottleneck. There's some way that you can break this down to get through it. So if you are a good athlete at muscle ups, then you probably can go over there and do an unbroken set. But most people that are in the sport, like the in between the bell curve, probably have to break this up quite a bit. Yeah, when I was looking at this workout myself, originally I see six, I'm like, I'm gonna go unbroken. Then I think about all the work that happens beforehand and immediately I'm thinking three, three on the first set and then feel it out right. from there. Yeah, you're not going to lose a ton of time by breaking on the muscle ups. You may lose to the best of the best, but you gotta think about like, who, who are my peers that I'm competing with? And if you're talking about other people that have average muscle ups and you know you're gonna have to go three three or two 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 or whatever it may be, then it's more about how do I manage my rest times faster and that's how you win this workout. So I had a lot of my athletes, you'll see Ali Daroma's on the, the uh, demo video. We came up with a strategy where it's two 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 the entire time. Her max unbroken set is eight, but when you're talking about combining all of those other things, it gets really tough for her and her form starts deteriorating. So what she did is she tried to transition quickly to the rings, do two, then take a 12 to 15 second break, do two, 12 to 15 seconds, do two, and then get back to the barbell quickly. So basically you tried to come up with a strategy that maximized her capacity versus trying to step beyond what she's capable of and blowing up. Which Absolutely. Is what and if you blow up on muscle ups, similar to like a strict handstand push up that we saw in the open, it could just you're be done. done. Yeah, yeah, you're done, and then you lose minutes instead of seconds compared to the field. And that kind of goes into the final thought before we break down the full workout, and that's transitions. And he, he, here's the key everyone thinks that, and I say this every week, I know, but like just I want to keep reiterating this until people actually realize everyone thinks that unbroken sets are faster. But if you have to well, take a 30 They are themselves, they yeah, are if, faster, if, if but you not could do that. overall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you have to take a 30 second break before you do a set of muscle ups, that's slow. So go from the clean and jerks 
to the muscle ups, to the rings, and do a set of three. And then come down and take a five or 10 second break and do another set of three if you're good at muscle ups. And that'll save you a net 20 seconds a round. Or on the first three rounds, if you know that I can do 15 unbroken chest bars, well, most people now in the sport can probably do that fresh. But if I go five, 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 and I go over to the bar right away and jump up, and I only take seven seconds between my rounds, now I'm net saving 16 seconds per round from that 30 second break I would have taken if I tried to go unbroken. Makes so, sense. Yeah, so just don't be a slave to trying to, to your ego or trying to go unbroken on these things. Break up the deadlifts, break up the chest of bars, break up the clean and jerks, obviously, and then break up the muscle ups with fast transitions, and you almost always will come out on top as far as time. And that's a huge, always transitions are the biggest separation value in almost every single workout in CrossFit. All right, let's break down this workout. So then overall thoughts for the workout. The first three rounds, almost everybody's gonna be able to get through relatively quickly. Bank yourself some time for the clean and jerks because we saw the onside athletes, that was the hardest part. You said up to 33 seconds per rep. That's a lot of time taken for six reps and then multiply that by three rounds. Yeah. There's your uh, there's your separation Most value. people didn't finish the workout because they took so long in the clean and jerks. So if they, and again, there's a point where you may blow up on the first three rounds. So don't do that, but also be a little bit more aggressive than you probably want to be on your deadlifts and chest bars because no matter what, there will be residual fatigue on the clean and jerks and especially in the first round. So what I told most of my athletes, if they're really good pullers, they may have done two sets on the deadlifts, but a lot of them just did five, five, five with like two second breaks. So they did a five, basically t stood up, took a deep breath and went back down five, stood up, took a deep breath, five. And then it was a fast transition to the, to the pull up bar. And then it was fives on that too. Even some of my better athletes that could do, you know, 40 chest of bars, you're not gaining a ton of time there but you still wanna be fast in your transition so that you are able to get to the next three rounds as quickly as possible. Well, that's another good point is that a break on a deadlift or a break on a chest bar is short, right? You can three literally seconds. drop off the bar if you're on pull-ups, like drop off, shake it out, jump right back up. Same thing with a deadlift, you can drop it, one, two, three, grab it, and you're like literally starting into your next rep. Yeah. There's not even a setup. Exactly, and so here's one of the quick examples that I'll give, and, and you probably won't be able to see it on the demo video, but I had two people going. Ali was one of them, and then someone else that was probably out of frame for this, but one did 15 unbroken chest bars, and Ali did six, five, four chest bars. She likes having a descending rep scheme, which is just kind of a psychological advantage. I, there's probably some physiological advantage there just based on more time under tension and then going to less, but. They finished, the difference was five seconds off of each round of chest to bars, where basically the 15 unbroken, yes, it's faster, but then he had to start taking longer breaks, and then by the third round, she had already passed him and was finished, or starting on her clean and jerks before he was, just because she was more fresh. So, I mean, there again, breaking these things doesn't matter as long as you can make sure that you manage your rest breaks, and then obviously get to the next movement quickly. Makes total sense, Brandon. Awesome. So then let's talk about the warm-up. Kyle's going to go over to the board. Hopefully he can talk through this. Otherwise, you can mouth it, and then I can talk over each Can we do a voiceover this week? All right, I'm going to keep it very brief. So we've got a general warm-up. We're just going to run through three rounds, 12 cows row, 10 RDLs with an empty barbell to mid-shin, then put the empty barbell down, do some bar-facing burpees over the empty bar. This is a good just general warm-up, general prep. Then we're going to get into our hinge prep. So deadlift, hinge movement. Your clean and jerk is setting up with a hinge, so we wanna do some glute activation. A quarter squat march with a mini band around the knees, that's a great way to get glutes fired up. And then a hip thrust with mini band around the knees, maybe 10 reps, 10, 10 of each. And then go through some banded good mornings just to prep that hinge position, make sure that it's ingrained before you start. Then I would recommend some shoulder prep. You definitely wanna get your T-spine warmed up go through some cat camels, depending on who you are, maybe even get up onto a pull-up bar, do some arch hollow swings. Uh, just get everything kind of moving and, and feeling pretty fresh. Get your scaps warmed up. This is important for keeping shoulders healthy, especially when you're doing 45 chest bars, 18 muscle ups throughout the course of the workout. And then finish with my favorite, Brandon called it when we put it together, McGill's Big Three. I mean, I think this is more of like an awareness of how to brace your trunk going into some deadlifts. Then finish up with your specific prep build to your deadlift and clean and jerk weights. I would do something like A1, three to four touch and go deadlift, rest 30 seconds, then two singles uh, of clean and jerk, rest 30 seconds and just build your bar like that. Once you're done with that, quickly warm up your chest bar and muscle ups. If you're someone who's gonna struggle with muscle ups, don't do too many in your warm up. Just make sure you get the positions fresh, get on the low rings, do some transition work, rest and go. I don't think this workout needs super extensive aerobic prep. I think this workout needs movement prep and I think it needs specific prep. I did your warm up last week and it really helped. Thank you, Chris.
All right, Kyle, come on over, my friend. I'll slide back over. Um, <laughs> I'll say the rest of this since you're How about it? That was actually impressive that you could finish that. <coughs> hey, guys, a reminder. Once you do this workout, please put a score in the comment section. It's a cool way for you to kind of look through and see who you're competing against. And then also, you know, as we get more comments in there, you'll be able to kind of get a good data sheet of like where you're at compared against the field. And good athletes, average athletes, kind of lower level athletes, beginners, whatever it may be, there's all kinds of different people. And obviously you get to see Travis each week who's a games athlete. And is the, isn't there something to having to put your score publicly? Yeah, I mean, I hold, hold you accountable. It creates a little bit of, uh, a little bit of anxiety going into the <laughs> yeah, that is. For sure. If you want to be on the Insta Spotlight, uh, Insta, <laughs> Insta Spotlight next week, what is it? T T T T D two. The clunkiest hashtag of all time. It's great. <laughs> Who picked this crap? Chris uh, did. Definitely you, Chris. Very sad. <clears throat> Stay yeah. tuned for Max's long-term developments. So this week on long-term development, we're gonna talk about barbell cycling. It seemed after watching the workout and getting some feedback that the 225 or 165 clean and jerks were the biggest component to slow people down in that workout. Now, the thing that I think from a long-term development standpoint that people need to do is pr progress themselves appropriately and check their ego. When you're comparing yourself against somebody that has 10 years of development in the sport, they've done all of the foundational work that's required to be able to cycle a barbell at that weight as if it's an energy system component. A way I like to get that across to athletes is to help them distinguish the difference between training and testing. What we did in the throwdown is basically create a testing scenario for you where you're racing. If you're going to practice racing, the things with regards to barbell cycling that you can focus on from a long-term development standpoint are as follows. The first, fast setups. When you're first learning Olympic lifting, there's so many cues, positions, what's your start position, set your back angle, and all of these little details that are necessary to become a good weightlifter, but really slow you down when you're trying to cycle a barbell. So fast setups, getting into it, getting your grip going, and getting through the movement as quickly as possible. Second, rest between sets or rest between reps rather. Every time you do a lift, you're basically trying to figure out how much time are you spending between each lift and figure out how much can you condense that over the course of your training. And then finally is maintaining your positions under fatigue. This last one from a long-term development standpoint is more about keeping your joints healthy and making sure that you're getting better over time. What I've noticed from people when they're doing testing and something that might be helpful for you if you're gonna do this workout is that you should scale loading appropriately. So instead of thinking, I have to do this workout at 225 or 165, take it as a percentage of your 1RM. So just as a reference point, Travis, who did our demo this week, it can clean and jerk 350 pounds. So 225 is a pretty small percentage of his one rep max. So if you're gonna try to get the same stimulus as him and practice these fast setups, the, your rest time between sets, and maintaining your positions under fatigue, you might wanna scale the percentage appropriately so that you're somewhere in the 60 to 70% of your one rep max range so you can actually get some long-term development concepts out of, your, um, out of your barbell cycling. Now, outside of testing, some of the types of training sessions that we do in our design and with our one-on-one -on -one coaching are first basically in order of development. So first thing people need to be able to do is create their position. So if you can't get your arms overhead in a solid position, if you can't get into appropriate front rack mechanics, then you need to spend some time doing movement work and developing the, the requisite mobility and body control that's required to be able to get into a position. You can check out our movement archive for that, for some ideas on how you could stretch or how you could move in different ways to be able to open up your body so that you can actually develop the positions required to lift. After that, technical development sessions. So you can find references like Catalyst Athletics has great references on positions, technique for weightlifting, or you can find a one-on-one -on -one coach around you, or you could do some video consulting where you send somebody a video, break down your positions, and better understand what it is you need to do with a barbell to have good quality positions. Then you need to work on your 1RM improvement. So if you need to be able to barbell cycle 225 really well, then you need to be on a strength program where your 1RM is much higher than 225 so you can turn that into a racing style format. If your one rep max is 245, for example, and you're using 225 in your workout, that's gonna put so much demand on your nervous system, it's essentially gonna turn into strength work, where you're doing a rep, resting a minute and a half, 
doing another rep, resting a minute, and that's just gonna be slow controlled strength work. So develop your 1RMs so that when you test, you can focus on all of these barbell cycling stuff. After you have the requisite level of strength, then you can play around with doing EMOMs where you're practicing doing barbell cycling at a certain loading, at a certain percentage for a certain number of reps per minute. You can do density sets or what we call clusters where you do a rep, you rest 10 seconds, you do another rep, you do that for five or six consecutive rests or reps and then you take a long rest and repeat that. That's something that we do pretty commonly in our CrossFit specific weightlifting programs to get people better at barbell cycling. And then finally, you can start to pair that, pair the barbell cycling with varied fatigue. So you can do barbell cycling intervals with muscle ups, barbell cycling intervals with burpees, barbell cycling intervals with double unders. So you can get all different types of training that allows you to then test your barbell cycling capacity over time. And if you follow a model where you train yourself, get your barbell cycling better, that will allow your testing over time when you go through a test retest cycle to actually get better and actually develop the requisite things that are required to be better as a barbell cycler in the sport. Hopefully this helps give you a model to better understand how to get better if you got exposed on the barbell cycling and testing. You can also check out a seven day free trial of the design where we do barbell cycling work almost every week so you can check out some of those sessions.